Hi, I'm Joe Amrosino here with BU head hockey coach Jack Parker, fresh off his 850th career win, if you can believe that. I'm going to be asking Jack your questions gathered in the BU community. And Coach Parker, we start with question number one. We're talking about the team here. Have you been, you've been blessed with some talented goalies in your coaching career. Which goaltenders are most memorable, and how much does it help the program like BU's to have a goalie coach like Mike Garagosian? That comes from a staff member here at Boston University. I come from Mike. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, uh, we have been blessed with great goaltenders over a long period of time. I think that's been one of the, the real consistents in BU hockey over a number of years. Uh, we certainly have a great one now in Karen Milan. He's given us a great season this year. He was uh, his freshman year. He was rookie, national rookie of the year. He led us to the national championship. So I think guys that pop in mind, the first guy that jumps out is Jim Craig. Obviously, he might have been the best goal, goaltender ever to play here uh, for his career here. Um, I think that John Curry is, is up there. He, he had a great year, a great number of years here. Uh, certain Cleon Deskalakis was a, was a really valuable goaltender because we, we didn't have great teams, but he, he, he kept us in, in championship runs because of him. Uh, but, you know, Terry Tolliver and uh, Sean Fields, you know, there's a whole bunch of them that have been absolutely fabulous for, for our program. And, and a big reason why we've been successful in the Beanpot, for example, in, in, a, in a shot series, you have to have great goaltending. And uh, we've always had that, it seems. All right, question number two, you have an especially young team this year. Will that help you in upcoming seasons? That's from a staff member as well. Uh, this is the youngest team I've ever coached. Uh, I've been doing it for 38 years, and the, the only, only team that compares is the very first year I had in 1973-74 season. So, uh, yeah, if everybody sticks around, we're in great shape in the next couple of years, but you never know. That's a big if. But uh, right now, we should, we should really be solid next year. We only have one senior that's playing regular. Uh, and if we had everybody else return, we'd be in great shape because we've got some real good kids coming in as well. Uh, how do you get freshmen to look long term at their player development when it might be easy for them to focus on immediate results? This again from a, a staff member here at BU. I think it's the most difficult thing in, in coaching today for all, you know, at any, at any level. And everybody's in a rush to get someplace else. Uh, they hear all kinds of voices other than yours. You know, there's agents, there's family members, there's, there's scouts, there's everybody telling them you're ready for the NHL. Or you're, you know, if you do this, you'll be all set. And, uh, it's, it's one of the most difficult things we have to handle, and it's, it's strictly communication. You have to constantly be talking to the parents, talk, constantly talking to the boy about what he's got to do to be good here. And if he's good here, it'll pay off in the end anyways. Question number four, what will this team's fourth place beanpot finish mean for the team as a whole, and how will you use that to motivate them? I think it's already motivated us. I think we played uh, pretty well coming off of that. I thought the practice we had, we were, we were embarrassed the way we played. Uh, I thought we played great against uh, Boston College. We lost in a real in an overtime, but against one of the best teams, if not the best team in the nation. Uh, I thought we played extremely well, and that's when we lost the Beanpot. We didn't lose the Beanpot the second night in the consolation game. Actually, doesn't mean much to a lot of people. It meant much to us, though, because we needed that game for NCA purposes. It didn't mean anything to Harvard, so it was it really was a consolation game to them. And yet they won, and we lost, and that was the most disappointing thing. But uh, we haven't been in that game very often, so it's not it's not something we can get used to. Question number five, if your team plays a flat first period, how much can you do to raise their intensity? That came from a contributor on the Terrier Hockey fan blog. I think it all depends, you know, uh, have they been going well for a while? Has this been, uh, has this been something that all of a sudden they just let, let slip because they weren't ready to play? Uh, or is it just the opposite? Have we not been going well for a while and they're, and they're down? You, you gotta be careful whether you go in there and, 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 and rip them and get into their faces when, they, when, they, when they've heard it too many times recently. Uh, but in general, there's usually some motivational talk from at least one of the coaches and maybe two or three of us. Uh, tell us about the uh, stability of your coaching staff. That's from an alum. Uh, well, I like my coaching staff a lot. Mike Davis has been with me for a long time now. I, I've had a, been blessed with great assistant coaches who have stayed for a number of years. Tut Cahoon was here for, uh, I think, for s three different occasions and for eight years. Ben Smith was here for eight, nine years. Uh, Blaze McDonald he was here for three or four years. Brian DeRocha was here for seven or eight years. Uh, so we've been blessed with really good assistant coaches over a long period of time. That's why we win, because we get good players and the, and the assistants get the players. And uh, the, uh, the only instability might be me. <laughs> but other than that, uh, I'm real happy with my staff. You know, we, we may lose somebody like Mike too. You know, there's going to be a lot of jobs opening up uh, in the next few years and uh, we'll lose people to, uh, to, to job hunts probably. But right now, I really like my staff. Question number seven, your defensemen tend to be excellent offensive defensemen, especially over the past few seasons. How do you get defensemen to gain an offensive focus without losing their focus on defense? We recruit kids that we want to be able to run the points of our power play, to be offensive guys, to jump into plays. 
but we also have to make sure that they can play, you know, their name is defenseman, so we want to make sure they can play at that end of the rink. And sometimes they get, it's easier to teach the defensive part of the game than it is to teach the offensive part of the game. So uh, we would like a little bit more size on defense. We're a little bit small. We got, uh, we're not getting any bigger next year. Uh, so in the recruiting in the next couple of years, we're going to be looking for a little bit more size. You know, we, we lost some big kids the last couple of years, and we'd like to get some of that back in our game. But other than that, we've always wanted to have offensive defensemen. All right, question number eight. This is looking ahead. I know we're still focused on this season, but the question is the question. Yeah. And the question is, how does next year's team look? Which players should we be watching? I think you want to watch Karen Milan. Is he going to be back here? <laughs> because if he is, next year's team looks very, very good. Uh, he's a key uh, returnee for us, and we've got three or four really good freshmen coming in. We've got a freshman who never played, only played one shift for us this, game, this year, uh, Yasin Sisi, who was a very, very good uh, player, and he would have been in this freshman class this year, uh, and he's returning and should be healthy next year. So uh, we're losing one guy. We're, we're, bringing in, we're bringing in one defenseman and three forwards in reality. So we're going to have more depth, more talent, and most importantly, all our freshmen and sophomores will be that much older and ready to play better hockey for us next year. All right. Some uh, questions about the team here, a little more broad. Uh, number one, has recruiting for elite players become easier, harder, or relatively same over the years? That's from an alum. I think recruiting for elite players has become much more difficult because there aren't that many elite players. Uh, therefore, there's many more people. There's a feeding frenzy on, on that one or two guys, and it's a real difference maker. Uh, and I think that's, there's a lot of good players, but there aren't a lot of Tony Amontes out there. There aren't a lot of uh, Billy Guerins out there anymore. Uh, and this number two is similar. Is, there, is it more difficult these days to keep your best players all four years? How do you persuade them to stay? That's from an alum. I persuade them to do what's best for them, and usually what's best for them is what's best for, for our program. It's very difficult to keep a kid after his junior year because of the, the new collective bargaining agreement almost forces the NHL team to sign him after the end of his junior year, so that makes it more difficult. Uh, you know, Brandon Yip stayed all four years, and it, it paid off for him. Matt Gilroy stayed all four years, it paid off for him. Kevin Gilroy left at the end, uh, Kevin Shattenkirk left at the end of his, uh, his junior year, and he's in the NHL. So there's pros and cons for leaving, but I think in general, most kids should stay all four years. Question number three, this is from a longtime alum, and you'll know what I mean when the question comes. I've been a BU fan since you were a player. My God. Uh, <laughs> in that what long, hospital is he in? <laughs> in that long-term view, what changes have you seen in the student athletes, their attitudes, desire to compete, and talent level? A few years ago, I was having dinner with Travis Roy, and, he, and I, I don't know if it was my 25th year coaching or my 30th year coaching, I forget which, and he said, geez, that's a long time. Must have been a lot of changes in that time. And I said, geez, not really, you know. I said, you know, the only two, cha you know, the game is just about the same. I said, you know, the things that coaches are doing things now that the Brown coach was doing in 1973, you know, but I said, the major difference is the face mask. That kind of ruined the game, putting the fit, full face shield on the game, made it more dangerous. I said, but other than that, the only other difference is the kids. The kids are much different. He said, what do you mean? And I just started telling him stories about coaching kids in the 70s, 80s, as opposed to coaching kids in the, in the 2000s. And he was aghast at what the difference was. And, and the major difference in, in, that I was telling him is that kids are more concerned with self. Kids are more concerned with the next step that we already mentioned. Kids think that uh, kids don't want to go to, to that school uh, unless I can play in the power play right off the bat because I'm only going to be there a year and then I'm going to sign my pro contract. Uh, there's a lot of people that are, that are misinformed about what their opportunities are and what's really going to happen to them. Every time I recruit a player, I tell them, look, I'd bet the mortgage on my house you don't make a living playing pro hockey, and I win that bet 90% of the time. And that's true of major junior A players or college players. But they don't get that. You know, but I'll be one of the 10%, you know. Uh, and I think that's, they hear so many different voices. They, they've been pampered a lot, you know, they've been catered to a lot differently. Uh, they haven't faced much adversity. Uh, and believe me, I love my kids. We've got great kids here, but for the most part, that's the major difference. That the kids have changed drastically, and I think kids have changed drastically in society, not just, all not just, yeah, in in, in every, in not just, not just hockey. You know, I see how my daughter brings up her kids as opposed to the way we brought her up. You know, so it's a lot different. Question number four: Which of your former players surprised you the most with his success or lack of success as a professional? That's from a contributor on the Terry Hockey fan blog. I don't, I, I don't think it'd be fair to say who, who had the worst career, you know. Uh, not too many guys have disappointed me that way. Uh, I think one of the great stories is John McCarthy, who was captain of our team two years ago. He was a, he was a partial scholarship guy for us. Nobody else was recruiting him. Uh, he turns out to be a very good player for us, captain of the team that wins the national championship, winds up in the NHL. Uh, I think that's, that's a great story. 
Uh, I think Matt Gilroy is one of the all-time great stories. A walk-on here becomes a Hobie Baker Award winner and is an NHL player now. Uh, if you told me that Matt Gilroy was going to be the Hobie Baker Award winner, never mind an NHL, or when he arrived here, after I told him not to come, uh, that would surprise me. And uh, he never ceases to surprise me. All right, question I shouldn't say that. Once he got here and started playing regularly, it never surprised me. I realized how good he was. Question number five, if you could determine one rule change for college hockey, what would it be? Again, that's from a Terrier Hockey Fan Blog contributor. No question. Take the full face shield off and let people play with a hot face shield. Uh, if the game was safer to play with a full face shield, why don't the pros wear them? Uh, that's their livelihood. It's, it's ridiculous. And the game is so much more dangerous because of it. Uh, and if we, could, if we could get that done, college hockey would be a much, much better off and the kids would be much better off. Can you explain that a little bit more for people who don't have a real good grasp on what that is, you know, who don't understand yeah. the mask? The full face shield covers your whole face down to your chin. Uh, the half face shield covers up to here, or protects your eyes. Uh, the full face shield was put on by, by attorneys, really, uh, because they didn't, they didn't want schools getting sued if somebody lost an eye. Uh, if you lost an eye, that would be devastating to somebody, but it's not the end of the world. You're not blind, uh, and if, you, if you, get, you, know, you get some chipped teeth or you get some scars in your face, that was part of hockey. Now people wear the full face shield, and it's much more dangerous because they think their equipment's made in heaven. They're diving all over the place. They think they can't get hurt. Number one. Number two, they can't see as well. And you've heard in any other sport, every sport you've ever heard, boy, we got blindsided. The worst thing that can happen to anybody is he didn't see it coming. Well, in hockey, you don't see it coming anymore because you have to, with a full face shield, you have to look down to see the puck. And kids were, since they were peewees, they've been told, keep your head up. Well, when you put that on, you have to put your head down. So you get blindsided more. So you get hit harder, you get hit more unexpectedly, and, you know, you're gonna, and if you just want to take it from a strictly litigation point of view, if somebody walks down the aisle with one eye, the jury would feel pretty bad for him. But when he, walks in, when he rides in on the wheelchair, they feel a lot worse for him, and the jury's going to pay a lot more. And, and in reality, that's the only reason why we have it, is the threat of a lawsuit. Uh, Ten years ago, 15 years ago, coaches voted 108 to, not, to nothing at the coaches' convention. The experts told the rules committee, get rid of the full face shield. It's made it too dangerous. The committee won't do it because they're afraid of a lawsuit. But it'll come because there will be a lawsuit, and that's when they'll get it. That's an excellent explanation. Thank you. Who is the one athlete at BU right now, other than a men's hockey player, whom students and alumni should see perform in person? That's from a blog contributor. I think they should go see the women's ice hockey team play, and you could pick three or four of them on that team. Uh, they've got a couple of women's Olympic uh, gold medal uh, winning team in the Olympics from Canada. Uh, they're a fabulous team to watch the way they move the puck, and they have two or three individuals uh, that are absolutely great, great players. And, you know, maybe when their season's over, I could get them over on my clock. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number seven. It's the NCAA championship. This is a situational question, so get ready. All right. Your coaching hat when, on. When are we pulling the goalie? <laughs> uh, someone's pulled the goalie. It's not your team. <laughs> okay. Here we go. All right, it's the NCAA championship game. BU leads by a goal. There's a defensive zone face-off with 20 seconds remaining in the game. The opposition has pulled their goalie for the extra attacker. Who are the six BU players that you've coached during your career? You would want to end that game with those 20 seconds, the face-off, and then the 20 seconds. Well, I guess I'd, uh, I'd want uh, probably Jimmy Craig in the goal. Uh, I think I'd take one of the best, if not best, defense we had here over a long period of time. And since I've been here, a guy named Jim Craig, I mean, excuse me, Jack O'Callaghan, uh, who was a fabulous player, but also a great, great competitor. Uh, I might want uh, Vic Stanfield out there, another All-American defenseman, or Bobby Brown, one of the greatest players ever to play here, who I was an assistant coach with. So I'd take either one of those two guys, take a flip there. Up front, you'd have to put Chris Drury in for the faceoff because he was a great faceoff guy. And he, Mike O'Callaghan, are the two greatest competitors I ever coached. Uh, on the wings, I'd, uh, I'd probably have Mike Rizzioni and uh, Maybe put Rick Mahara out there, the, uh, even though he was a center iceman. In case Drury got, got kicked out, you could put Ricky in there and take that. And uh, those, those guys were, were fabulous players. And if, if that wasn't available, I'd probably go with Dave Silk, because he was not only a great player, but he was a great defensive player as well. I noticed you kind of went back in time a little bit to build this team other yeah. than Drury. Uh, <laughs> kids have changed. <laughs> Uh, players were more responsible and more alert to the game than uh, in, 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 uh, in the 70s and 80s, I think. I, I think one of the most difficult things is to find kids that really know how to play ice hockey. And uh, I think that uh, 
Dave Silk know how to play ice hockey. Michael Rizzioni know how to play ice hockey. Uh, we've got guys on our team that do, but uh, it's not quite the same as it used to be. All right. All right. What constitutes a smart, solid play in the neutral zone? That's from a blog contributor. Making great decisions at either blue line. Uh, there's times when you're at the attacking blue line, you don't want to dump it in. You want to hang on to it. You want to make plays in front of the defenseman because they're backing off. Or you want to make plays behind the defenseman because they're standing up with slash support or indirect passes. But there are times when it's one on four and you should get the puck in deep and, and make sure you don't turn it over there. The same thing holds true when you're, when you're 10 feet outside the, your own blue line or 10 feet inside your own blue line. You want to make sure you make great decisions there. Because turnovers at either blue line usually result in unbelievable opportunities for the other club because you're going the wrong way and they're going, the, they're going hard at your net. All right, number nine. This is a beauty from a blog contributor. If you had the power to change the outcome of one game in the past, which game would it be? Uh, if I had the power to change the outcome of one game in the past, uh, I would say the 1997 or the 1991 NCAA championship games, which we lost. Uh, 97, we lost to North Dakota by a goal, and in uh, 91, we lost to Northern Michigan by a goal. I was hoping you were going to say the 91 game, because yeah. that's when I was here. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was an unbelievable game. Yeah. I remember a few years later, I was sitting at T. Anthony's having lunch, and in walked Tony Amonti, who was playing with the Blackhawks at the time. And the next day, they were playing the, the Bruins, so he was in town. He knew I was up there, so he came by to say hello. And I just happened to be reading the Globe, and they had all the, the NHL teams scoring and who were the highest scorers on every team. And Amonti was leading the Blackhawks in scoring, and Keith Kachuk was leading his team in scoring. I think it was Winnipeg at the time. And Sean McGeckin was leading the Pittsburgh Penguins in scoring because Mario was hurt. Uh, and I said... Look at this. You know. How the hell did we lose in 91? He said, Coach, we, we got seven goals. Goal, goal scoring wasn't our problem. You know. Uh, <clears throat> but that was a great team, and it was an unbelievable game. It was a triple overtime game, and uh, uh, we, know that, you know, we know that winning the national championship in, in, in overtime is pretty nice one way. It's awful to lose it that way. And the 97 team was a great team that uh, Chris Drury was a, a junior on, and Sean Bates and those guys were seniors. And, uh, we had just upset Michigan the night before. They were the big favorite, and we beat them in, in one of the best games we've ever played. Uh, and we come back, and we're, we're, on, we're in the lead against North Dakota, and then turn the puck over a few times at blue lines. And uh, we had a great goaltender who, you know, he was great at everything, was an All-American here, but the only thing he really wasn't really good at was breakaways. Uh, and we, we let them get three breakaway goals. So it was a, uh, or two breakaway goals, and that caused us to lose the game. But... Uh, in general, those two games, games that come back and remember, geez, imagine if we had won those two, you know. All right, number 10 here. Have you been surprised by your team winning a game that you thought you had little chance coming into the game? Uh, I always think we're going to win the game, but uh, I, would, I guess I would go back to that Michigan game that we upset Michigan in the, in the uh, 97 semifinals. They had the Hobie Baker Award winner. They were the number one team all year long. And I know you know this fellow, but maybe our fans don't know him. But Elliot Dribben was, is, is our biggest fan. And Elliot was on the road trip with us. He probably was on every road trip with us in those days. And uh, <laughs> I was walking to the game with Elliot, because the hotel wasn't far, our equipment was out there, so we didn't take a bus. And I was walking to the game with Elliot and another guy, a friend of his. And uh, I said to Elliot, what are you doing after the game, Elliot? Because he used to like to have a beer someplace after the game. Uh, and it was the semifinal, and if you lose, you go home, you know. I said, what are you doing after the game, Elliot? And he said, packing. <laughs> so I, uh, I've always held that up to him. because You don't have to pack tonight, Elliot. You got another game to watch. You know? So that was probably the biggest upset. That or when we went into the year before, uh, the 91 game, uh, when we went into, uh, excuse me, it was the, uh, yeah, it was 90 when we went into Michigan State and beat them as the number one team. We had to beat them two out of three in those days. And they were the number one team. And that probably, nobody gave us much of a chance to do that either. This is from an alum uh, wanting to know if it's possible to stream coverage of the games on the website, being pot turning and otherwise, right onto the, uh, the BU website there. I have a hard time with my cell phone, so I have no idea. I, I don't know how to text message, so you'd have to ask somebody that knows something about that technology. Uh, and I know that they're, you know, Mike Lynch and, and our department, Brian Kelly, they're always constantly trying to figure out how to get more people more games available to all our fans. Yeah. All right, number 12. Uh, this isn't a question. This comes from an alum. Just a hope that BU will find a winning formula to match that of rival BC. We know how this goes. Tides turn around here, but that's the question or statement. Yeah. 
we didn't find it this year. You know, we found it the last couple of years. BC's had a, a great team last year, a great team uh, three years ago when they won the Nationals. I think, I think two years, uh, when we won the Nationals in uh, uh, two years ago, when we won, <coughs> I thought that was maybe in 09, that might have been the best team I've ever coached. I think this year's BC team is the best team they've ever had that I can remember. And I'm talking going back to Joe Mullen and those guys, you know. So this is a terrific college hockey team. They've got everybody back from last year's national championship team. And uh, I think we're getting closer to them. I think, we, the, as you say, we're the youngest team we've ever had at BU. So, uh, but it does change. You know, we, we were 2-2 two and two with them last year when they won the Nationals. We were, I think we were 4-1 and one with them the year before when we won the Nationals. Our record against BC is pretty good. Our record against BC is better than it is against Providence sometimes, you know. So, uh, in general, I'm, I'm not too concerned about being able to continue to compete with BC. They're going to always get great players. We're going to get great players. They're always going to be a team that, that we mark ourselves against, and I think vice versa. All right, some personal questions here. This, uh, this is a good one. So put your thinking cap on. You, Jerry York, and Red Berenson get to play together on a line in a senior hockey tournament. Who are the three other players you'd want on the ice with you on your team? This should be good. Besides my <laughs> cardiologist? Uh, I'd probably take Ken Dryden in goal, and uh, I'll be a little provincial here. I'll take uh, Robert Gordon Orr on defense on one side, and I'll take uh, Ray Bork on the other. And uh, they'd have to carry me and Jerry, <laughs> all the NHLs. Jerry and I, excuse me. Safe response there. All right, uh, there's another personal question. This comes from a blog contributor. What's the number one on your bucket list, personally and professionally? Uh, personally, I'd like to go to Australia sometime. I, I think about that quite a bit. I'd, sometime I'd like to go. If they can beam me down there without having to take that long flight, I'd be going tomorrow. You know, but, uh, That's something that's in the back of my mind. Uh, professionally, I'd like to have uh, a chance to, to win some big games in, in March and April again. Yeah. Go to Australia. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> All right. Number three. You had uh, the uh, heart bypass surgery last July. How are you feeling? I feel great. I've, uh, I've done all my cardiac stuff, you know, uh, twice and sometimes three times a week. But fortunately, I have a pretty good facility here that yeah. I can work it all out, and I have Mike Boyle to watch over me, and uh, so I don't have to go in the hospital to do that stuff. And uh, I'm back playing tennis again. And, uh, I feel pretty good, except game days and game nights. You know, I still don't sleep after games that well, and that's that's a concern. Uh, but other than that, things are going pretty well physically. Knock on wood. All right, and a question that many BU hockey fans have, you hear it all the time. How much longer will Coach Parker be here? And how will your retirement affect the program when that day comes way off in the future? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I always take it year to year. My contract runs till 2015. Uh, I, I, can, I won't be coaching after 2015 in all probability. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. It all depends on how I feel at the end of each season. And I feel pretty good right now. And uh, it also depends on, you know, what the outlook is uh, for other things to do that I might want to do, you know. I don't want to retire at 73 and realize I can't do anything else. I don't have the energy for it, you know. Uh, when I say other things, I don't mean a, a real job, you know. I'm not looking for work, as many G. Krebs would say. Uh, as far as uh, what happens after I leave here, Boston University would be in great hands. You know, this place has always wanted to have a good hockey team. They, you know, they built a, a fabulous facility. They, they know it's an important part of the fabric of the university and they want to they'll go out and get the best coach available and that coach will do a fabulous job here. And that coach, you know, there's some fans in there that might say, let's get, get him out of here now so we can get a real good coach in here. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, th there's mixed emotions about when I should leave. <laughs> you joke about it, but I mean, you're well loved here in the Boston University community, come on. All right, lastly, what will your legacy be here at BU? Well, I know what it usually is for a coach. It usually is your one loss record. You know, how do you do? You know, did he win some championships? Did they win a lot of games, you know? <clears throat> That's usually what, how they measure a coach at any, at any institution. I hope my legacy is that uh, my players felt that we tried to get the best out of them and pushed them to be as good as they could be and gave them the opportunity to be as good as they could be, but also think that we really cared about them as people and, and, and how they performed academically and how, how they are after they leave here.